Jesus was lost, but now I found was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears How precious is that grace upon the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed. Well, good morning, Calvary Chapel, Temecula. How are you guys doing on this fine Sunday morning? We good? All right. Praise the Lord. Welcome if you're joining us online. Well, in case you guys didn't hear, we had an election Tuesday, and I think it went pretty well. Just my own opinion. There's a phrase uh, that I've been kind of sharing with people, if you're familiar with it, a rising tide lifts all ships. And I think that you know, in a few years, the improvement is going to touch everyone's lives, whether they voted for Trump or not. Whether, no matter what their political views were, they're going to see the improvement. And, uh, and hopefully people realize that, you know, this man is not Hitler or any of those other things, but loves this country. So praise the Lord. God was merciful and gracious. So we thank him for it. Hey, uh, we just want to recognize, I won't embarrass you by having you stand up, but let's just recognize those that have served this country with Veterans Day this weekend. And if you served, uh, okay, go ahead. We'll stand up. Go ahead. Stand up if you are a veteran or active military. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Um, yeah, the sacrifice that you guys are making. And uh, if you are Marine Corps, Happy birthday. Go ahead, you guys can sit down. All right, so we have just a couple of quick announcements for you guys. Um, thank you to everyone that participated last night. We had a great second Saturday. Uh, if you provided food or drinks or you were involved in setup or the games or whatever, we just want to thank you. It was awesome to really just have some cool fellowship. I mean, we're a small church, and we had, I don't know, maybe 50 or so people. So I'm just like, Probably better than half the church was actually at the second Saturday, so it was pretty awesome. And so thank you for that. couple of announcements. Today is the last day. If you want to do the um, Christmas boxes, today is the last day to get a box. And next Sunday is the last day to turn it in. You have to turn it in by next Sunday because they have to get mailed off and they won't reach their destination in time if we don't mail them off by next Sunday. So if you want to do that, please grab a box today and get it turned in by next Sunday, okay? Also, today's the last day for the book sale. So we have our table set up out there. Uh, just so you guys know, all the money from the book sales is uh, going to the church to help support um, events and things like that. So all the proceeds, all the profits, everything is coming to the church. So hopefully if there's something out there that strikes your fancy, you'll go ahead and pick it up. So um, please, after service, check out the tables and pick up some books if, if that's something that you want to do, okay? And then, let's see, I believe tomorrow night we are men, if you haven't uh, heard yet, we're not going to have Bible study tomorrow night because of Veterans Day, so we'll meet again the following 
week. And I think that was it. I don't think I'm forgetting anything. I hope I'm not forgetting anything, but it is possible. So let's go ahead and stand up. And we're going to ask the Lord to bless this morning's service. And then we are going to worship him. Okay? All right. Lord, thank you so much for this morning, my brothers and sisters that are here. Everyone that is uh, serving within this church, Lord, would you just bless us this morning with your presence? Would you help us to put our eyes on you, uh, rejoice in who you are, Lord? And I know that a lot of people are going through things, whether physical struggles, financial struggles, even relationships that might be strained. And I just pray this, this morning, Lord, that you would speak to each and every person individually. As Pastor Joe teaches the word, Lord, just use that word by your spirit to minister to each one of us where we need it. And uh, that you would be glorified, Lord, in our hearts and in our minds, and that we would be edified at the receiving of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there joy in this room today? I think so. Amen. It's the joy of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is our strength. Let's sing about the river of God that comes forth and blesses his people and brings joy to our hearts. Amen.
Amen. It's okay to rejoice in the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be his name. We know that all creation will one day be just shouting out to God. The trees of the field will lift their hands and the rocks will cry out. But even now, we give praise to our God. And as we just take a look at God's creation, the animals, everything is meant to give praise to the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's falling from the clouds, a straight and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder. Skies like cannons in the night, the music of the universe plays. Singing, You are holy, great and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so
your love for us is so overwhelming. Your glory, your majesty, we recognize, oh God. We sing praise to you, oh God. Bless the
Lord, we do worship your holy name. We lift our hands, our hearts, our heads to heaven because you're there. Not only because you're there, but that you're inside of us. You live in this temple, the temple of the living God, which is your people. You've always wanted to dwell with us, and we thank you for that, Lord. That wouldn't be possible without you. And We glorify you this morning, we worship you, we bring everything and we lay it before you, Lord, our heart, our mind, our our life, our family, our work, everything. Father, we ask that you would meet us here today, touch us with your word and with worship and fellowship. Lord, we know you never let us down, and we pray that you would continue to make us faithful through giving us the power of the Holy Spirit to live the life that you intended for us to live. So, Lord, be with us. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated, and junior high and high school can be dismissed. I had a wonderful time yesterday, and our second Saturday, we played Bible Jeopardy, which was amazing. We loved it. You get to see everybody's competitive juices come out, you know, and uh, it it was a great time. If you haven't attended one of the second Saturday fellowships, we do a lot of eating, fellowship, and some games, and, and so forth, like a family. So you're more than welcome to come on out next time, second Saturdays of every month. And let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Acts chapter 7. The chapter is a lengthy one, but I felt that it would be appropriate to try to take it as a whole because of the context that... Stephen will lay out for those who have put him on trial in the Sanhedrin court. Now, if you remember, Stephen was raised up and he powerfully shared the gospel. He was sharing the word of God and he had a run-in and a debate with those at the synagogue of the freedmen. These were the intelligentsia and most likely Saul of Tarsus was part of this group at the synagogue. And they took issue with Stephen's communication about Jesus. And they charged him with two very important crimes. Uh, The first one you can see back in chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. And the second one is in chapter 14. It was that Jesus taught that the temple was going to be destroyed. And so they saw that as a blaspheme against the temple. And then the second charge against Stephen by the court was that he blasphemed the law of Moses, that the law of Moses had no longer any application, and that he wants to change the times and customs that Moses delivered to the people of Israel. And so this is the trial that he stands before now. He is now going to give a defense to this court of what the facts of the matter were. And again, of course, by the end of the chapter, you'll see that It wasn't Stephen that was really on trial. It was the court itself. It was those who killed Jesus. It was the same group of people who put Jesus on the cross. And Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, will give his presentation as not a defense of himself primarily, but as a defense of Jesus Christ and of the things that he was teaching. And so notice in verse 1, you have the high priest said to Stephen, are these things so? So are these two charges, are you guilty or not guilty? And the high priest at this time most likely was Caiaphas. And, you know, Stephen's not going to defend himself, but he will give a certain um, presentation that will set them straight. And it's going to be a brief history of the forefathers. It'll be a a history of those that they align themselves to. If you remember in John chapter 9, you had the blind man being healed by Jesus. And then as the blind man was interrogated by the religious leaders in the Sanhedrin court about this event, 
what did the blind man say after he was being pressed about this Jesus? He says, do you not also want to become one of his disciples? And the leaders say, we are not going to be this man's disciples. We are the disciples of Moses. We know Abraham, and we would never do those things that you have done. And, and they just showed their disdain and disgust for the man that was healed. And so they aligned themselves with the fathers, so to speak, whereas this Jesus was pitted against Moses and the fathers. And so this similar time is happening here with Stephen. And though they prided themselves with the fathers, Stephen is going to show them that they are just like their fathers who opposed God's plan and opposed the prophets that were sent to them and even opposed the Messiah that they just recently put to death. And you could imagine the reaction from this group of scholars hearing Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, bringing forth several witnesses. In fact, he'll bring forth four witnesses. He'll bring forth Abraham, the father of the nation. He'll bring forth Moses to the witness stand. He'll also discuss Joseph and also appeal to Solomon and the temple. These four witnesses that he'll bring forward will, beyond a shadow of a doubt, present to them a history that they have forgotten, that they were the ones opposing the word of God. They were opposing God's plan of redemption yeah. through the people that he had sent. It wasn't Stephen. Stephen was on the right side of things, whereas the fathers in many cases were on the wrong side. So he goes to lay out his case, and he starts with Abraham. He calls Abraham to the stand, and notice Stephen said, brethren, fathers, listen. He appeals to their attention, but is very respectful. This is the court, the high court of Israel. So he still calls them brothers. He says, incline your ear to what I'm going to say because it's going to be very important. So the appropriate address here in a legal environment, he said, fathers, listen, brethren, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. And said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. So the first person he mentions in this call to Abraham to come to this wonderful promised land known as Israel, he mentions the God of glory. This was the source of God's redemptive plan was God himself. It was the glory, the God of glory. And it's only used in this passage in another time in the Bible in Psalm 29. And it would be a God of glory because glory is the summation of all God's attributes. And it's this is where the fountainhead of redemption would flow. It is this God of glory that spoke to Abraham, our father, when he was in Mesopotamia. He's talking about Ur of the Chaldees. He's talking about the area, uh, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, the, the land of Ur by the Tigris and the Euphrates River where Abraham dwelt. Notice, before he dwelt in Haran. So Genesis tells us, chapter 12 specifically, says that though he was called in Ur, he went to Haran, which was about 500 miles northwest of Ur. If you look at a map today, it's north of Syria and up against the borders of Turkey itself. That's the area of Haran. And then in Haran, in Genesis 12, he repeats the call to come to this land that I will show you. He repeats it twice and said, get out of your country from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. To leave everything, to drop everything and follow God, that's not too much different of what God calls sinners to do today, is to drop your old life, leave what's keeping you back from salvation and come to a new land, a place of spiritual regeneration, a place of relationship. A place where God and man can now fellowship. And that's what we have done if you've received Christ. But then he goes on, then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, remember his father was Terah. Terah died while he was in Haran. And he, notice he, God, moved him, Abraham, to this land which you now dwell so he's speaking of the promise, of course, of Genesis 12, and it's been reiterated through the book of Genesis, even in chapter 15 and so forth. And notice in verse 5, 
And God gave him no inheritance in this land, not even enough to set his foot on. In fact, Abraham never possessed the land. He came into the land, but never owned much of it except his burial plot described in Genesis chapter 23. He never received the full inheritance. He never was given and fulfilled the promise that God had promised him. He was given the promise, and he certainly received that. But he never received the totality of the promise. In fact, if you go back to Genesis, you'll see that the promise literally lied between the Nile River, all the land from there up into into the Euphrates River. That is a big swath of land, and certainly Abraham never possessed the land that he was promised. He only set foot in it and then bought a burial plot. That was the extent. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession. So Abraham said was given this promise by God, even when he didn't have a child or an heir, this promise that your descendants would ultimately be in this land after him and that they would inherit this promise. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years. So the promise would not be fulfilled in Abraham's lifetime, nor would it be fulfilled in the time frame after Abraham. What would happen would be that they would go into this land that he's describing here for 400 years. And that land, of course, was Egypt. And that's where, you know, 75 of, you know, Jacob's clan went into Egypt and lived for 400 years until Moses would lead them out in the Exodus. So Stephen is recounting this, this man of faith, and he's telling and reiterating, reminding them to understand that Abraham was a man of faith and that they were not acting like Abraham. They were not acting like their father that they identified with. You see, Abraham lived by faith. He is the father of faith. He's the father of the nation, so to speak. And ultimately, it would be Stephen that would be following Abraham's example and not this council of the Sanhedrin. And notice in verse 7, And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, Egypt it's speaking of, I will judge, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. So Abraham, of course, didn't have enough people to start a nation in the promised land, and nor did the uh, sons of Jacob have enough people. It was 75 people, the Bible tells us, that went into Egypt under Jacob and his sons. And so they would have to, what you call incubate, ultimately in Egypt, in order to grow their numbers, build their strength, build their wealth, and then they would come out a nation. They would come out hundreds of thousands strong, even in some estimates, several million strong before they came into the land. And so you have this uh, wonderful promise of God working it out, you know, bringing forward this, this promise to Abraham over a long period of time. And even today, you think about Israel. There's millions of people that live in Israel, and they still have not possessed all the promised land that God had promised. They have just set their foot in a little part of it. And Israel will one day have all the land between the Nile and the Euphrates, where their enemies are dwelling now, showing the full conquering, the full overcoming and overwhelming of their enemies in the end, that all Israel will be saved, according to Romans chapter 11, Paul would say. And that promise to Abraham would be fulfilled. But notice, then he gave them the covenant of circumcision. Now that covenant of circumcision was a snipping away of the foreflesh, and that would be the sign or the illustration of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And those that you know, receive the circumcision, it would be a sign of this, but it's also illustrating the snipping away of the heart, the flesh of the heart, the sin that we all desire. That is what the intent and the purpose of this covenant was. It was to relate to God, to relate to holiness and to purity, to relate in a way which is not governed by the flesh or sin. It is a relationship based on our love for God and God's love for us. 
And so they gave them Abraham, the sign of the covenant, circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 patriarchs. In other words, Stephen is telling them that the whole nation was birthed in faith. It was birthed in faith and a trust in God, that trust that was not present within the court at the time of Stephen's presentation here. It lacked faith. It lacked the trust. And when God visits the people of Israel, as he did Abraham, in Abraham's day, Abraham received the promise of this inheritance and gladly followed God, but the council did not. That Jesus visited them, God visited them through his son, the Messiah, and they completely rejected faith in the Messiah. So if anyone's on the wrong track, if anyone's identifying with the fathers of faith, Abraham in particular, it was Stephen. It wasn't the council. I think the council is starting to get a gist of what Stephen's trying to communicate, and this anger is just going to build and build and build before they blow their top by the end of the seventh chapter. And so, unfortunately, they were on the right and wrong side of things. But in verse 9, now he's going to say, thank you, Abraham, you're dismissed. I'm going to call Joseph to the witness stand. And Joseph, in verses 9 through 16, he'll take them again back to Genesis. He says, and the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. So you remember the story of Jacob's sons. Ten of his sons sold Joseph into slavery. They wanted to kill him. You know, Reuben uh, dissuaded them from doing that. Instead, they threw him in a pit, and they sold him off to Midianite traders who took him to Egypt and sold him off, ultimately, to Potiphar's house. But that was a betrayal of Joseph. And it was a graphic illustration of Israel's spiritual blindness when Jesus came too who was also betrayed by his brethren, by Israel, by the Jews, ultimately, just like Joseph. So Joseph's life certainly presents us a picture or an illustration of the life of Christ. Joseph was sold into slavery through envy and jealousy of his brothers, of that wonderful multicolored coat that he received from his father, and also the dreams that he had of the wheat stalks bowing down to his and to the stars, the sun and the moon bowing down to him and so forth. They had a problem with that. They became jealous and envious and they sold Joseph off. The same is true with Jesus. They became jealous and envious of Jesus. He was the special source of blessing as Joseph was a special source of blessing that they didn't recognize. And they ultimately sold Jesus into the Roman hands for his crucifixion. But notice also it says, but God was with him. Thank God for that. What a great summary of those early chapters of Genesis that tell us how this, this Joseph rose to second in command behind Pharaoh over all of Egypt. You know, And it also reflects the relationship between Jesus and his father. Notice Joseph was put at the right hand of Pharaoh, second in command, and so does Jesus. He ascends to the right hand of the father. So Joseph is a wonderful illustration of Jesus and delivered him, verse 10, out of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh the king and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. So Joseph endured many troubles just like Jesus did. You remember how he started as a slave in Potiphar's house. He was charged with a crime of rape that he didn't commit. He was thrown into jail, and in jail he met a butler and a baker who had dreams. He interpreted those two dreams. The baker would be killed. The butler would be restored to his position before Pharaoh. And Joseph said, remember me, butler, when you come back into Pharaoh's court and let Pharaoh know that I'm still here. And in time, in the years past, that Pharaoh had a dream, didn't he? Pharaoh had a dream of seven gaunt cows and seven healthy cows and seven you know, stalks of grain and, and seven other, you know, gaunt stalks of grain that ate up the healthy stalks. And it was a, an interpretation that only Joseph could give to Pharaoh. He came before Pharaoh and he said, hey, those, those cows refer to famine that's going to strike. Seven years of famine. Seven cows, seven years of famine. Same with the stalks of grain. 
Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And Pharaoh said, you know, basically, we need a man of wisdom. And what? who better than you, Joseph, to put in place a famine policy to save the region, to save Egypt? And the seven years of plenty, they stored all this grain, and it would be ready for the seven years of severe famine that would come. And Joseph rose to second in command behind Pharaoh himself. And Jesus would also be delivered from his troubles, wouldn't he? And be exalted to the right hand of the Father. And then he would be putting this redemptive plan in place to save his brethren, much like Joseph was going to save the region and his whole household under Jacob from this famine, ultimately. So here you have this wonderful promise through Joseph. And notice in verse 11, Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. So it was a horrible famine. The Bible says it was a severe famine. And ultimately, it would be a famine much like the Jews would experience in Israel after the time of Jesus. That they would, after his death and ascension and resurrection and so forth, that Israel would go through a spiritual famine that is lasting until this day. It is still in a spiritual famine with the blinders over their eyes. But thank God for Romans 11, where all Israel will be saved at the second coming of Jesus. All Israel who believe will be saved at the second coming of Christ. And so this, this policy that Joseph puts in place to preserve the region with grain from Egypt is much like what Jesus did to provide spiritual blessing and nourishment and sustenance to the people who had a spiritual famine going on, and that was sin that was dominating their life. And so Joseph brings this wonderful illustration to bear, and I'm certain that the court is putting two and two together of what he's trying to say about Joseph as it relates to Jesus. Joseph saved his brothers from physical death, and Jesus will save his people, his brothers, Israel from spiritual death in this spiritual famine. And so notice what it says here in verse 12. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers. So he's referring to the fathers or Jacob's sons, you know, the sons. At this point, there was 11 sons under Jacob and the 12th Joseph was in Egypt at this point, the fathers of the nation. And so it says, and the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. So he's saying that the fathers were wicked. They sold Joseph off, ultimately. Uh, remember, the fathers of the nation. Jacob's sons were the fathers of the nation, so to speak. And they sold Joseph off. And so he's telling them that it's the second time when his brothers saw Joseph in Egypt is when they recognized that it was Joseph and that he had everything they needed to be saved in this famine. So also it is true that the first time the wicked rulers of Israel would reject Jesus and then the second time they see him at the second coming of Christ, they will finally realize that they've made a huge mistake in Jesus. So Stephen is driving home the point that just like the fathers who rejected Joseph, you have also mistakenly rejected your Messiah. You've rejected him the first time he came, but the second time, like Joseph, you will be reminded of who he actually is. And Zechariah tells us, the prophet, that we will mourn because of the mistake that they've realized they've made. That the Son of Man will appear in the clouds of heaven. They will return to Israel and they will mourn like they're mourning for the death of their firstborn son. Just grieving and gut-wrenching. And that's the moment where Israel will realize that Christ is their Messiah and believe in Israel be saved. You see, Stephen is saying that you're following a pattern of rejection that has been instituted in the past. You reject people the first time and you endorse them the second time. You're now in that first rejection and you're making a big mistake, counsel, by rejecting Christ and my words that I teach. And so they will be angry at the end, but Joseph is doing his best through the 
being full of the Holy Spirit. They're seeing hints of Jesus come through here at this moment. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, he and his fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tombs that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. So here you have Jacob and the nation, his sons going down to Egypt because of the famine to get food from Joseph. They stay there. And now Stephen's going to move from Joseph to talk about Moses, whom they also rejected. And so you see, but when, in verse 17, the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, that's the promise of the 400 years of captivity in Egypt, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, and also the promise to remove them from that 400 years of captivity. Till another king arose who did not know Joseph, This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them, exposing their babies so that they might not live. So we remember the decree of Pharaoh that said, kill all the Jewish male babies. Um, The numbers of Jews were multiplying in Goshen in the Nile River Delta region. He became fearful that they could revolt. He ended up enslaving them. They were the workforce of Egypt to build a lot of Egyptian structures. And so you have this to introduce Moses' coming onto the scene in verse 20. And this time Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. So Moses survived the edict of Pharaoh for three months, being raised in his parents' home. And then that that couldn't continue indefinitely, so they put Moses in a basket, put him into the, the river, and floated him down the river. And notice what is said in verse 21. But when he was set out into the river, that is, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he, that's Moses, was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. So Moses realizes at a point in time of his life that he is not Egyptian, that he is a Hebrew. He is of the lineage of those whom Egypt enslaved. And God was moving on his heart. He wanted to see how his people were being treated. He had a heart for them. He didn't want them to be abused and so forth. And he began to really play out this affection for his people and begins to go see how they were doing And then notice, it says in verse 23, now when he was 40 years old, he came into the heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. Now the one who was oppressed was a Jewish slave, as we know from um, the scriptures. And also he murdered an Egyptian guard because of his mistreatment of this Jewish slave. And this tells you how much he saw the injustice of his people being treated in Egypt under slavery. For notice in verse 25, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So at 40 years old, Moses kills this guard. And he was hoping that his people, the Jews in slavery in Egypt, would understand his heart for them that God had sent him to deliver them as a people out of the bondage, out of the abuse, out of Egypt ultimately, but they did not understand, and and for good reason. You know, God sends someone to to murder an Egyptian guard. And though we see Moses' intentions and sincerity is right, he went about it the wrong way. It wouldn't be deliverance through Moses' power, through Moses' hand, or Moses' strength, It would be deliverance through God's strength. It would be on his time. It would be in his way. It would be with his man. And ultimately, they misunderstood Moses' intention, and the people didn't recognize God's intent to use Moses for the deliverance of his people. 
And this would be instrumental in Stephen's presentation. He says, and the next day he, that's Moses, appeared to two of them as they were fighting. Now there were two Jewish slaves of his people fighting and tried to reconcile them saying, men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away saying, who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian? That must've been a big wake up call to Moses. Wow, the word is out that I did that? You know, it's another way of saying that Moses killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand, you know, and Moses knew that he couldn't stay in Egypt at this point, that the word would eventually get back to Pharaoh and there would be problems. And so, but underlying that phrase, who made you ruler and judge over us, because it's going to be very instrumental in Stephen's presentation. It's showing that the people rejected Moses the first time, you see and would receive him the second time. Just like they rejected Jesus the first time, but would ultimately receive him the second time. Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, that means he's 80 years old, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And and Moses trembled and dared not look. Then the Lord said to him, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them and now come. I will send you to Egypt. I mean, hear the drums just roll on that last final statement there. But what Stephen's doing is saying that I have nothing against Moses. I acknowledge that God gave him a mission, that God appeared uh, to him ultimately. And certainly this burning bush that was not consumed would break up the monotony of a shepherd out in the middle of the desert. You know, think about him seeing this thing. And then the bush starts talking to him. And then he says, take off your sandals and so forth. I mean, that would have been a very uh, big wake-up call to, to Moses, the shepherd in the desert. And ultimately, he's sending him back to Egypt a second time. First time, they misunderstood Moses and his intentions and God's intent to deliver his people. Now he sends him back the second time. Notice in verse 35, this Moses whom they rejected, Stephen says, saying, who made you ruler and judge is the one God sent to be ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. We know that that angel of the Lord is Yahweh or Christ himself talking to Moses to give him the law, to give him that calling back to Egypt. But Stephen's point here is saying that the one that you, the people rejected was the one hand through which they would be delivered. It is Jesus Christ whom they rejected, much like Moses, will be the hand through which the people would be delivered. Moses is making the point of a pattern of rejection, not walking in the faith of Abraham, rejection with Joseph, recognizing him a second time, and now Moses rejecting him the first time, only recognizing his hand through God's power and spirit, The second time, this is much as what is happening now between you, Sanhedrin, and Christ himself, the Messiah. You're doing the same exact thing. So he's bringing their culpability to bear. And when people uh, are starting to realize their culpability, they can have two reactions. Their heart can soften or it can harden. And right now it's hardening. He brought them out. After he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness, 40 years. So notice that his plan and intent was fulfilled through Moses. He was indeed the deliverer and God worked through the man that he chose to lead his people out of bondage. But now in verse 37, Israel rebels against God and those he sent to deliver him, he's going to start to talk about. And he uses Moses again. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, 
the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. So he cites Moses as giving the prophecy of the Messiah, the prophet that would come later and be the one through which they would be delivered. And so even Moses, Stephen is saying, prophesied the coming of the Messiah, Christ himself. He's on the right side of history. The Sanhedrin council is on the wrong side. This is he, speaking of Moses, this is he, Moses, who was in the congregation in the wilderness and the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. So Stephen points out the fact that their past history is a reflection of rebellion, wanting to go back, much like this council is doing. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the work of their hands. Again, he's building a case, showing them that they continued to disobey the man that God had chosen, that they rebelled by falling into idolatry, much like the idolatry that they were in now. They idolized the temple. They idolized their position. They idolized their traditions. They idolized everything they should have been worshiping, and that was God and his son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. They made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to idols, rejoiced in the work of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. So Stephen reminds the council of Amos chapter 5 and Jeremiah 25 regarding their idolatry. And notice what he says here. He starts to quote the book of Amos. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifice during 40 years of the wilderness of the house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god Rephan, images which you made to worship and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So he's saying to the council, you accuse me of idolatry? You accuse me of blasphemy? Moses and the law and the temple itself? You see, it was the fathers or those descendant from the fathers in the wilderness who began to worship other idols, began to build temples to different gods and deities. You see, the history of Israel, he's saying, has been a history of rebellion. And make no mistake about it, that rebellion continues today. And Peter's words still remain true. Hopefully it will be just but for a short time more. So he is not standing with the enemies of God. He is standing on the right side of God. And he is taking Moses very seriously. But in verse 44, it kind of shifts gears in addressing their accusations of speaking against the temple. Now, he's going to deal with that, that charge of blaspheming the temple building itself. He said, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. Notice that was that temporary meeting place. It was the tent of meeting. It was portable. The priest picked it up and moved it to the next location. It wasn't permanent. This is what he's referring to here as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land of promise, into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. And it's interesting here, he's telling the council that this tent of meeting, this tabernacle of witness that was portable, was what God, where God met man at the time of the wandering in the wilderness, and also the time when they entered under Joshua and the nation was being established by even David. That was where God met man. But David said, I'm living in this wonderful palace. I want God to live in a temple or in a permanent structure, a house of the Lord. God didn't ask for it. You see, David suggested it. 
out of the love for God in his heart. So he's building a case at this time that it was Solomon who built the temple of David's suggestion that a temple be built. Of course, David couldn't build that because he had blood on his hands. He was a warrior. He had too much uh, killing um, in the past, but his son Solomon would build it. But what he's saying is, God didn't ask you to build this temple. God didn't ask you to build the one that was you know, permanently built with stone and gold and silver and so forth in Jerusalem. He was perfectly fine living in the tabernacle of witness that he had before. So he's setting up them to understand that how can you blaspheme something that God never commissioned to be permanent in the first place? And so you have this, this verse 48 telling us, however, the most high God does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand not made all these things? In other words, he's saying, I didn't need a temple. The world is mine. Amen. The heavens are mine. Amen. The earth is mine. Amen. The cattle are mine. All the cattle that are on a thousand hills are God's. They're his. And so Stephen is, is setting them straight on the whole history of this permanent temple that he's being charged of blaspheming that God didn't ask for it, God didn't need it. The tabernacle of meeting is what he instructed uh, Moses to do and to bring ultimately into the land and to offer sacrifices in Jerusalem, and that was the place where he was doing. And they did that. It's not that God cares about the temple, but that we care about the God of the temple. Amen. See, and that's where many of us go wrong. We think that if we you know, we're coming to church or we are part of church functions, that we are one of his children. We're, we're thankful to the Lord and so forth. But he's actually looking at the heart. The building is just the building. It's the building. It's the people in the building that are the big issue and their relationship to the God of the building, so to speak. You see, they had turned everything around and idolized the temple instead of the God who instructed the tabernacle of witness in the very beginning. They got their priorities all turned around. And what a great message that Stephen is giving them. They need to understand this. This was the very reason Nebuchadnezzar came in 586 BC and destroyed the permanent temple. He destroyed the city. And then Jesus said, not one stone will be left here upon another because they idolized the temple. They idolized the ceremonies. They idolized their traditions. They idolized their routines and did not worship the Lord. Their heart was far from them. What a caution to everybody who calls themselves in the name of Christ that they have forgotten who Christ is in their heart. Not all these other things that revolve around it, but the personal relationship that we all have with the Lord. Stephen is saying, you have forgotten that. And you have placed your eyes on something that will perish and didn't keep your eyes on something that was eternal, and that was God himself. And so what a masterful presentation that he's giving. Nebuchadnezzar was the hand of God to destroy this temple. If destroying a temple was blasphemy, God cannot blaspheme himself. He cannot commission a Gentile leader to destroy the temple, the temple being used by God to chastise his people if it was a blasphemy. God doesn't use sin directly from his hand. Sin, I mean, he can work through people's sin to bring about his will, of course. We know that. But he does not sin in order to bring discipline to his people. He is holy, righteous. There's no shadow of turning in him. He has no darkness at all, James says. In God, he cannot tempt, nor is he tempted. But nevertheless, he destroyed the temple through Nebuchadnezzar. It's because it became a stumbling block to them. And this is what Stephen is pointing out to them. In verse 51 now, Stephen will now dismiss his witnesses and start his closing remarks. You know, just like an attorney in a court of law, he's going to give his closing statement. He says... You stiff-necked, or stubborn, 
and uncircumcised. Notice, if you're uncircumcised, you're not in the covenant. So he's saying, you people are stubborn and not even in the covenant that God gave to Abraham. And these are the 70 of the most brilliant scholars sitting before him in the council, wearing their robes with all their wealth, with all their function in and around the temple. You uncircumcised, stubborn people in heart and ears. Notice, their heart was hardened to God and they didn't listen to those God sent them. And that sealed them off from truth and from being blessed by the Lord. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. This is the whole point of Stephen's message, that you have a history of rebellion, you have a history of rejection, whether it be Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Solomon, the temple. This is what characterizes your past, in other words. This is the point that he wants to make, driving it home. And verse 52 which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Notice how he words this. Usually it's, which ones do you persecute? As if, you know, persecution was the exception to the rule. But no, he says, which ones have you not persecuted? In other words, to not persecute a prophet would be the exception to the rule here. They continued to kill the prophets. You can think of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and the rest that they persecuted and did not listen and hardened their heart against. The self-righteous of God's people were the most, in the most significant danger and the most significant danger to God's plan than anyone else. And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one or the Messiah or Jesus, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers whom have received the law by the direction of the angels and have not kept it. So they're saying, you have killed another one that God has sent. The most important one of all, the just one, the righteous one, the holy one, the Messiah through whom the nation would be saved. They have committed a murder with intent and they sinned against knowledge because all the oracles of God all the law had been delivered to them. They should have known the very day that Jesus was going to come into Jerusalem. If they read seriously Daniel the prophet and they read chapter 9 when the Messiah would be cut off and not for himself, they would have known through doing the calculations, running the numbers, that it would be that moment that the Messiah would ride in fulfilling the prophecy in Zechariah that he rode in on a foal of a donkey, a young donkey that had never been ridden before. They should have been waiting. Say, okay, today's the day because it's very exact. They missed it. The time of God's visitation. I mean, we can know the word of God. We can know the Old and New Testament. We can be raised in a Christian home and still miss the main point that God wants to share with us. And that is a relationship with Jesus. The Messiah that he commissioned that he sent to save the world in righteousness. The one that died on the cross, the one that rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father, who is now giving us that food we need in the spiritual famine in which we live. He is that Joseph of old, preserving his family and offering food to everybody who would receive it. And that spiritual food is trust in Christ and the reward, this wonderful blessing at that moment is the filling of the Spirit. The right relationship with God, the empowering of God to live the Christian life. You're on your way to heaven at that point. And you will ultimately be glorified as well, just like Jesus was. And so, what a beautiful way to put this. And he is putting the culpability right in the lap of the council. You have become the betrayers and murderers, just like in the past what the people have done when God sent them warnings through the prophets and so forth. But you have not kept the word. That's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? That, at this point, would be the straw that broke the camel's back with them. They had had enough. Remember earlier in chapter 6, it said they couldn't resist the words of Stephen? 
that he disputed with them that they couldn't resist it. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And this is another time in which he used that wonderful message, spirit-filled. And so we see the reaction in verse 54 from the Sanhedrin council to Stephen's defense. And we see his martyrdom here too as well. When they heard these things, when the council heard what Stephen was saying, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. I mean, they were furious. I mean, being cut to the heart literally means they were sawn under. They were cut down. They feel that somebody ran a buzzsaw right between them and they were falling to the ground like a tree that was cut down. They were devastated with this, this word. And you know, some people have certain reactions. We often experience those act- the reactions that we don't expect. You know, we don't expect, you know, people to to attack you violently, physically. But in this sense, the gnashing of teeth refers to that bitter anger that I don't know what else to do but to kill this person. That's how much rage and anger they had as they rushed Stephen at the end of his message to, to deal with this. And, you know, wow, what a mature way to react, right? A group of scholars that are known for discussions and debates about theological issues, they couldn't handle it anymore. They didn't see the connection between their theological positions and their rejection of Christ. They stayed on the outside of it all. The heart of Scripture, they stayed on the outside. They built a fence around the Scriptures, and they were outside that fence still. They were idolizing their fence rather than what the fence was there to protect, the Scripture and the prophecies and God and His Messiah and so forth, but they gnashed their teeth. And, you know, the Spirit can work in different ways and have different responses. It's not always the one we expect or, or want, but this is outright hostility, and um, it's probably an indication that you're doing something right when this happens, not that you did something wrong. If you're not being belligerent, of course, and you're respectfully presenting the gospel and this happens, it means you've touched a nerve that you're doing your job, that you have presented the truth and some people don't deal with it uh, that well. But that's not your problem. That's the Holy Spirit's problem. And they were just filled with rage. They couldn't handle it. But he, notice, being full of the Holy Spirit the whole time, he shifts gears now. Instead of the violent anger, the hate, the rage, he He gives us what the proper reaction should be when experiencing this kind of hateful environment. He said, full of the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What an amazing vision of glory that God gave Stephen. What a beautiful thing of grace that the Lord gave him. And that's what we also need to do when we're suffering persecution, is to remember the glory of heaven, the glory of God. He started it out with the God of glory. He ends it with the God of glory. It's when we lose track or lose sight of what awaits us as reward, what awaits us in heaven as the bliss and the comfort and all those things that held us back will be done away with that we see the Lord face to face. Many of the scholars call that the beatific vision. When your eyes lock to God's eyes, you know, Christ himself, that you're permanentized in this state of bliss. You're made complete. You're all you can be in Christ at that moment. It's called glorification. And, you know, your life now, your study of the scripture is all preparing you for that moment when he reveals himself to you in that beatific vision, and you are permanentized, sealed up, and you are all that you want it to be, all that you can be in Christ. He'll make sure that he brings you to that moment. But it's also our responsibility to yield to the Spirit so he can prepare us for that moment. And preparing us for that moment means that you can receive as much as God can reveal to you. And God is infinite. You're obviously a finite being. We can't hold it all but we can hold as much as we can and enjoy it as much as we can. And that's what he's doing even now. He's building your capacity to receive from him by studying, by yielding, 
by praying, by all these different things that God uses to sanctify you and bring you to maturity, that's what he's doing even now, even in light of the violence that, that Stephen here is going through. But I love it says he's standing. Twice it says he's standing. Normally, Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. But here he's standing. Why is he standing? Because he's about to honor the first martyr of the church to come into heaven. Think about that. It shows respect. It shows honor. And what do you do when you hear a great performance? You give a standing ovation, don't you? And so it suggests that Christ is very pleased with Stephen. Very pleased with his witness to stand in opposition, to give the truth for the sake of the people, not for his own defense but for the sake of the people. That truly is what Christ did on the cross, and that's what he calls all of us to do even today. And so he stands, and what an amazing thing. And that's probably what we'll see too. When, when we're about ready to pass into eternity, I bet you he just shares his grace with us and gives us that vision of glory to help us transist into heaven. In verse 57, they couldn't take it anymore. He was too full of the Holy Spirit for them. Too much truth. They couldn't handle it. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. Think of the unity of rage that is happening here. Boy, not mature at all. What happens to people whose worldview collapses? This, when they're not ready for it. This. Well, he's just destroyed their whole love affair with the fathers. You know, they thought they were perfect and they weren't. You know, we can often hold a relationship with the Lord and think that we are good, we are okay, and we align ourselves with the Lord and with the word of God, but then live a whole life that's opposite of it. You know, it's not past the Christian to do this or make this particular mistake as well. We need to bring our behavior and our lifestyle in concert or in, in consistency with the word of God. Creed and confession needs to match your walk and your talk, you know, ultimately. And so they ran at him with one accord. They cast him outside the city and stoned him. That's where they brought all the, the deaths, the executions. They did it outside the city, much like the Lord was executed outside the city. You know, and it's interesting. They seem to just run roughshod over the law that they were forbidden to use capital punishment. They had to go through the Roman government to do this. But they were so taken up with the moment and so enraged. Remember, mob violence doesn't have a mind. It's a mob. It just gets Stephen, brings him outside the city, and ultimately stones him uh, to death. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, this is a powerful verse because it shows you the transition from Stephen to Saul, or what we know as Paul. And he's going to pass the baton to Paul to continue this wonderful preaching to the world, to bring the message out. In fact, in chapter 8, verse 1, it says Paul was consenting to the death of Stephen. And later in the Bible, it, in the New Testament, it says, I cast my vote against them, against the Christians, like Stephen. So he was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He saw all this take place, and it would, he would never be the same from this. It would be a pebble in a shoe, like I said last week. You know, it would bother him, the words of Stephen, and the Lord would start pressing the goads against him and start to move him in a direction. He would fight it, we know, by Acts 9, and he would finally give in when the Lord says, why do you persecute me? He's persecuting the church. He says, why are you persecuting me? Because the Lord lives in the church. And the church lives in the Lord. When you persecute the church, you're persecuting Christ. So Paul will rise up in the chapters that come. But notice as we wrap up, and they stoned Stephen, and he, as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Boy, doesn't this remind you of somebody else who died on a cross about 2,000 years ago? How Luke says, Lord, receive my spirit. He, he, he gave his spirit up to the Lord. Into your hands I give my spirit. Then he knelt down, that shows capitulation by Stephen, and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Wow, that's another statement Jesus made. Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He is totally in the spirit here. 
What a crucial mark of a Christian to forgive others that sin against us. Saying the same thing that Jesus said. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Wow, what a beautiful way to put this whole violent event. That death is temporary. It is almost as if you're sleeping. It's not teaching soul sleep or anything like that. You're fully consciousness, conscious in the afterlife. But he uses the word asleep because when you look at a dead person, their body looks like they're sleeping. So it's more of an observational language that he's using here. And so it's another way of saying Stephen died. And a lot of us, when we see the death of loved ones, we see the death of Stephen, we, how could this be? And we're so, we can't make or come to terms with death oftentimes. And we start to go round and round with machinations of, of why certain loved ones die. Why, Lord? What is your purposes and plans? And we just never quite get there. But, you know, it's interesting that God has a different vision and perspective of death, especially of loved ones. I noticed in Isaiah 57, 1 and 2, it says, The righteous perish, and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away, and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Those who walk uprightly enter into peace. They find rest as they lie in death. And so, in a way, death is a reward. In a way, especially a death like Stephen's death. One that is totally committed to the Lord. The one whose life is put on the line. He may never ask you to die physically for your faith, but maybe the day is coming. Who knows? But he will give you the grace to do it if that day ever comes. But at least we can live and be a living sacrifice for the Lord today, according to Romans 12, can't we? We can offer our lives to God as a living sacrifice, not as a dead one. You know, and that's what we should be doing, offering ourselves to God. Hebrews eleven thirty eight. 38, notice what this says about death. Many experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword, and they went about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy. You see, death often helps the righteous avoid the evil that is to come, and also removes from the world those people who are not worthy to be given to the world at this point. And that's all in God's hands. But it gives us a different perspective of Stephen's death here. That God can use a death, that we call it martyr. The word martyr means testimony. Testimony is a testimony of how you died. Literally. A testimony when you share it is how you died from your old life and have come into your new life in Christ. So you can be a living martyr today by sharing your testimony with your neighbors, with your friends, and God will bless it because his spirit is working through you. So be encouraged. And we can be encouraged by Stephen's stance here as well, can't we? Okay, let's all stand together. Let's thank the Lord for, for all that he has, has given to us, the opportunities he's given to us, the open windows to share the word as you're full of the Holy Spirit. And God will use it according to his will. Okay? All right. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the story of Stephen, Lord, and his message because we can often be sidetracked and, and see ourselves without an accurate self-appraisal of who we're aligned with and thinking everything's okay, but maybe we're not living according to our confession, Lord. According to Scripture, Father, help us to understand like Stephen helped the council to understand that there were problems from the beginning and there's a contingent always that seems to reject or oppose God's work, whether it be through their mouth or through their lifestyle. Lord, they plant a picture of you that is not accurate in other people's hearts and minds. Lord, I pray that you would help correct us all, Lord, that you would bring us back to center through your word, that we don't fall to this error. Lord, that you would lead us, lead us forward, Lord, and help us to be consistent like Stephen in walking his talk and being ready to share in season and out, no matter what the cost, as our culture gets darker. Lord, we thank you. 
We praise you. We ask that you would bless us as we go forward in your word. Help us to worship in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name. Sing that to you. Our God is an awesome. 
give him praise. Amen. Thank you, God. You are the faithful one. Yeah. When the world's falling apart, he's the faithful one. Continue to rely on him in every circumstance. Bless him. Bless one another. Have a great day in Jesus. Amen. We'll see you. God bless you. Us was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my peace. How precious did that grace abide the hour I first believed my change.